Ottawa recently announced help for small and large businesses in the form of a wage subsidy up to 75% to help keep people on the payroll. To talk more about it is political journalist Brian Lilly. Brian joining me once again from Toronto. Now, Brian, this applies to many business owners, but not for lawyers. Not for lawyers, not for work, many professions. Look, as with any government program, you hear about the announcement and you hear about who it's going to help. And then a little while later, you start hearing about who it won't help. And so lawyers reaching out to me, you know, on the small uh, side, you know, maybe uh, one or two lawyers in a small practice together. They've got staff on hand or chartered accountants, other professions. And they're saying, look, we don't qualify under the Canada Revenue Agency rules as a small business. We are, uh, cons you know, we're in a different category. And the way this is structured now, it's not going to help us. So it's not going to help us keep our paralegals on staff. It's not going to help us keep our secretaries on staff or other people. And this becomes a real problem. And it's the type of thing that has shown up uh, time and again. Look, I, I think that the, the federal government have been very complimentary to them in uh, doing what they can albeit it's a little bit slow in getting the money out the door compared to, to other jurisdictions. They're doing what they can to try and deal with a health crisis that it's turned into an economic crisis. But there are always going to be people falling through the cracks. And this is a real issue. I mean, just earlier in the week before they announced this, I'd been writing about how you know, so many private sector employees have been sent home without pay or just laid off and told, look, we don't have anything for you. The doors are closed. We can't do anything. And at the same time, there were government employees, many of whom, by the way, are working from home. But then there's a whole other category of government employees working from home, getting their full pay and, you know, living next door to people who aren't getting anything. So there's going to be a lot of divides, a lot of problems with any sort of government help. They're doing what they can, but there's, you know, people are going to be falling through the cracks, Hal. And that's what we have to worry about because it can create social divides and social unrest. Now, when it comes to credit being offered by the Business Development Bank of Canada, Brian, many types of businesses will not qualify, including nightclubs, bars, and cannabis operations. Yeah, those are just some of the places that are speaking up and saying, hey, wait a minute, we don't qualify. But also a lot of other businesses stepping up and saying, uh, this is taking way too long. Even the folks at Business Development Bank of Canada are saying, uh, we're overwhelmed and we don't know what to do. So it might have seemed like a good idea at the time, but now you're getting need up against bureaucratic uh, stasis, I guess. I mean, they're just frozen. They're saying, how do we make sure this is done right? They they're looking for the rules. These are people who are risk averse. The Business Development Bank of Canada is not out there like a hedge fund trader looking for the next big startup and they're going to put a lot of money and they're going to take risk out and they're going to look for a big payoff. No, these are government bureaucrats who are lending out money. I mean, I mean, consider how conservative and cautious a banker can be. Now make them a government banker and they're even more cautious, even less risk averse. And so a lot of businesses stepping up and saying, this is not working out the way that it should. And you're going to see an awful lot of businesses in through no fault of their own. Look, normally I would not be in favor of government handouts to business. I would not be in favor of all these wage subsidies. But we're talking about an economy that's being shut down by government dictate, by municipal governments, by provincial, to some degree, by the federal government. And and people need to eat. We all need to be able to put food on the table at the end of the day. You and I are lucky. We're able to continue working, but a lot of people are not able to. What do you do when you're getting mass unemployment like this? You've got to do something. Otherwise, people will go to work. The virus will continue to spread and the health concerns will grow instead of shrinking, which is what they're trying to do. And with COVID-19, Brian, a quarter of small business owners say they don't know where they will get their rent or mortgage money for this month for April. Yeah, and it gets even worse when you get into sectors like uh, personal services or hospitality. So, you know, think about the place where you get your haircut, Hal, and every man in the country, more so than women, not exclusively, but even more so, we tend to keep our hair shorter, we need our hair cut more often. We're all looking around saying, um, it's getting a little long, it's starting to feel like the 70s, what do I do for my haircut? Well, the person that runs the barber shop or the salon where you go to get your haircut, they are very worried about what they're going to do for the rent or their mortgage payment if they own the place, where they rent the place. They don't know where the next payment's coming from. 
The Canadian Federation of Independent Business surveyed their members and a quarter of members said, we don't know where April's rent or mortgage payments coming from. But when you got to hospital or when you got to personal services like barbers, like nail salons, like hair salons, it was 32 percent. Even worse for your neighborhood restaurant, bar, cafe, 44 percent. I mean, these are cash intensive businesses. Cash comes in the door. Cash goes out the door. It pays for employees. It pays for products. This is how the economy ticks. And they're saying, we don't know what we're going to do and we're done. And as we just talked about with the BDC, nightclubs and bars, they're not qualifying for some of these loans. And some of them, let's be honest, whether you like them or not, they're big employers. As Canadians wonder about the future, especially the economic future, MPs are taking raises and the Trudeau Liberals are even hiking the carbon tax. Brian, during the COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, it's hard to believe that this went through, but it did. Look, on the issue of the raises, let's deal with them separately. On the issue of the raises, this has been going on for about 15 years. Uh, I believe it was back in 2005 that a bill passed because MPs were tired of well, voting raises for themselves, and then they'd get a lot of bad media attention. You know, it never looks good for a politician to say, I want a raise, but don't we all? I mean, don't you wish you could vote yourself a raise, Hal? You know, have a meeting with yourself, vote yourself a raise, we would all do it. And so politicians said, this isn't working out. Let's make it automatic. So every April 1st, MPs in Ottawa get a raise based on an aggregate of the public sector and private sector wage increases that are tracked by the government department in charge of labor statistics. So they look at all these things and they say, okay, one year it's 2.1%, one year it's 1.5, the MPs get that. So right now, the MPs base salary, this is before their housing allowance, their per diems, what they get for being on a committee or a cabinet minister or being the PM is $178,900. It's going to go up by about $2,700. The PM, regardless of who it is, and right now it's Justin Trudeau, regardless of who it is, the PM always makes double the regular MP. So he's going to go up to just about $364,000 with a $5,000, actually just shy of $6,000 raise this year. And that is going to leave a bad taste in the mouths of a lot of Canadians who are saying, uh, okay, maybe you deserve it, maybe you don't, but right now? And the same thing goes with the carbon tax. Uh, the carbon tax, along with uh, you know, escalator taxes on alcohol and cigarettes and other issues, they're going up on April the 1st. So, hey, welcome. It's April 1st. Welcome to your, your new tax. It's wonderful, isn't it? You're paying more. Uh, why? Well, I asked the prime minister about this in his uh, you know, teleconference uh, media availability the other day, and, and he talked about how it's going to put the more money in your pocket, not for the average uh, suburban or rural person. If you live downtown, you're probably doing quite well with the carbon tax rebate. But people living in suburbia, people living in rural areas, you are going to be paying more, no doubt about it. Maybe the carbon tax increase in the races, it's happening April 1st, maybe just an April Fool's Day joke. You wish it would be that, but it's <laughs> going to go on all year, Hal. Brian, Canada's hitting the pause button on immigration due to COVID-19. Tell me more about that. Yeah, it was uh, some, an issue that was raised to me by, uh, by a friend and said, well, hold on, or, you know, we're supposed to be bringing in 341,000 new permanent residents this year. Is that still going ahead? So I called up the immigration department. I, I said, okay, what's going on? Essentially, it comes down to this. During the travel restrictions, nobody's allowed into the country except existing permanent residents. So if you're already here, you're a citizen, landed immigrant, or the like, you can come in or immediate family members can be brought in. Everyone else is barred. So if you are coming in from another country to move here, you can't right now. And that is a good thing. I mean, it makes no sense to tell us you can't go visit your neighbor and then, you know, be bringing in thousands. I mean, it's almost a thousand people a day, if you averaged it out, that we would be bringing into the country to move here. It makes no sense for them. It makes no sense for us. Let's, you know, flatten the curve, as they keep saying. But also on the economic side, there are no jobs right now. And there are some immigration programs that require you to have a job to come here. A lot of those jobs, Hal, they're not there right now. They may come back, they may disappear forever, but they're not there right now. And so economically, both for the immigrant and for Canada, it doesn't make sense. I mean, I can't imagine my parents 
wanting to move to Canada, and they did in 1968. But I can't imagine them wanting to move to Canada if they'd already agreed, okay, we're going there, and then, you know, two weeks before or a month before, the whole economy, you know, heads in the wrong direction. You don't want to be doing that. So they're putting a pause on it now. Conservative immigration critic, Peter Kent, who, by the way, is an immigrant himself, he says we should maybe put a pause on it a little bit longer until the unemployment rate recovers, because he figures that at the end of this, we're going to be left with a big unemployment figure as the economy tries to come back to life. Yeah, we've seen the unemployment rate rise 15 percent, along with a 25 percent drop in GDP. Brian, economic predictions of COVID-19 crisis can be summed up in one word, dire. Yeah, the, the parliamentary budget officers uh, suggesting that we could be into this social distancing that we're all experiencing. Uh, up until August, the um, deputy medical officer of health saying it could be into the summer that we're going to be in this type of situation. That leaves all of us wondering, when are we going to get back to work? So the PBO's prediction is a 15 percent unemployment rate in the next quarter, a 25 percent drop in GDP in the next quarter. And then after that, they expect that it'll start picking up again. Zero growth for a little while. After that, 5% growth, which is quite good, but averaged out, they're predicting the slowest economic growth in this country since 1962. Let me put that into perspective. My parents weren't really in the workforce in 1962. They're retired now uh, and well into their 70s. So there's not a whole lot of people working now who were working then. And so most of us have never seen an economic slowdown quite like this, Hal. Brian, COVID-19 is making things very tough for logistics or trucking industry with smaller truck stops forced to close and restrictions at larger ones. Even getting a cup of coffee is challenging for our truckers. I mean, here in town in Lethbridge, there was a trucker pulled off to the side of the road, went up to a local fast food restaurant through the drive through asked for coffee, and they told him to take a hike. Such disrespect yeah, for our truckers. Unbelievable right now. And even where they're dropping off supplies, they're being told you can't use the washroom. Uh, one of my colleagues at the Toronto Sun did a, a report on this, and he talked to one trucking company owner in Rosetown, Saskatchewan, who drives wheat between Saskatchewan and Alberta. And he's being told, look, he stops at uh, one restaurant, one fast food restaurant. They'll let him walk through the drive through The next one, they won't. So they're trying to get a cup of coffee. They're trying to get a bite to eat while they're on the road. They can't. They're told all over the place, you can't use the restroom. Talk to a, a trucking company owner in Oakville, Ontario, right here in the, the, the greater Toronto area. And they're being told the same thing. And someone sent us uh, a series of signs from places where truckers are dropping off saying, no access to the restroom. Do not enter the facility. Stay in your truck. You know, Ontario Premier Doug Ford, I asked him about this the other day, and I'm sure other premiers and the prime minister will have things to say. But look. They all keep saying, all the politicians from the prime minister on down keep hailing truckers as the unsung heroes of what's going on. Without them, we don't have the medical supplies yeah. that our hospitals need. We don't have the, the, the food on our store shelves. We don't have anything going on without these guys. And we're telling them, you can't stop to go to the bathroom? Give me a break. So after Premier Ford made those comments, I heard from uh, a spokesman for FedEx was thanking him for that and saying, we need to have respect for our drivers. Uh, I heard from the United Steelworkers, who represent 2,000 trucking and courier drivers across the country, who say the same thing. You've got to allow people to have basic uh, facilities, basic uh, ability to, to get a bite to eat, to use the bathroom. Otherwise, everything stops. And it, Premier Ford put it in a very good way. Can you imagine if the truckers turned around and said, all right, we're not dropping anything off? We'd all be at a big loss if that happened. Absolutely, you bet. The federal government is asking for the release of some prisoners, Brian, and some provinces are allegedly refusing to send people to prisons. One man apparently violently attacked a police officer near Toronto within hours of being set free. Yeah, look, I, I understand the theory behind this. And in theory, it works and it's been used elsewhere. Release nonviolent prisoners, um, you know, people that are in prison for... Uh, you know, things that don't include assault or rape or murder, because prisons can be hotspots for this. And we've started to see COVID-19 showing up in prisons across the country already. And if it starts to spread there, then it spreads into the wider community because you've got guards, you've got cooks, you've got wardens. And guess what? They all go home at the end of the day. 
And if they've been exposed to it, they're going to expose their families. And then it's going to spread into the wider community. So there is a public health concern. But where we draw the line is on violent criminals. And there was one guy who, you know, long track record, bad record. A Toronto judge said to this man in York region, so that's just north of Toronto. You know, well, we can't send you to prison because of COVID-19. Within an hour of him being released, he was violently attacking a York region police officer. It was caught on video. There are photos of it. Um, just an outrageous story. So I get it in theory, but it's got to be handled in the right way. And we've already seen that's not always the case. Toronto Sun journalist Brian Lilly, thanks again for your time today. Thank you, Hal.